Hey, welcome back to our channel. In today's video, I want to talk to you about the wolves of Yellowstone and give you a little primer on the reintroduction of wolves. If you're going to visit Yellowstone, we really want to give you the backstory behind the place as well. Okay, this is a wolf here with the number 926F, and they number them by when they capture them and collar them. So they'll sedate them and collar them, and they do that so that they can study the wolves. And so this was the 926 wolf that they've collared. And F, of course, means it's a female. And she has the nickname Spitfire. And this wolf here, her mother died, was shot by a hunter outside of Yellowstone. You can't hunt inside of the park, but surrounding the park, once they leave the park borders, they can be hunted, depending on the state laws. Her mother was shot, so she took over the pack, and she mated with uh, a wolf named 925. And one time she was pregnant and they were invading another pack's territory to hunt for food this is what wolves do occasionally when they're when they're desperate they'll go into another pack's area to get some food and the other pack found them and attacked them and spitfire ran off pregnant with her pups she had some she had some little pups and she was pregnant and they went running off and 925 her mate just stood there and basically took the brunt to save his family. He ended up running off in another direction and leading the enemy pack in another direction and saved his family. Spitfire survived. Uh, some more intrigue later on with Spitfire where she uh, ended up wooing some another mate from another tribe who was ready to take her and her pups down. Um, anyway, she ended up herself getting shot when she left the park and this was just in 2018 when that happened now let's just step back a little bit in this uh, presentation i want to give a little bit of information about the history of wolves in yellowstone wolf behavior and where to see the wolves when you visit so in 2020 the park celebrated the 25th anniversary of the reintroduction of wolves to yellowstone so wolves were native here, but in the 1920s, they, the last wolf was killed. It took a while to kill them all off, but, but they were exterminated by the 1920s. Gone for almost 70 years. And then in the 70s, there began a movement to, to bring them back. And it started with this Endangered Species Act. They added wolves to the list. And then the National Park Service uh, developed a policy of preservation and that again it began a movement but it took about 20 years before they finally reintroduced wolves and in 1995 they brought 14 wolves from canada and over the next two years they brought some others and then these wolves have um, reproduced on their own and have grown in numbers ever since so this this is a map here that shows in the green area the historical range of wolves they've covered the continent at one point but now mostly up in Canada, and then they dip down into the Rocky Mountains, of course, a little bit on the borders, border of U.S. and Canada up there, but only dipping down here into the Rockies, interesting, down there in New Mexico and Arizona. This is an image of them bringing the wolves through the Roosevelt Arch on the north end of the park near Gardner, Montana. Uh, they're bringing the wolves in this truck here, a bunch of people watching. This was quite a big event, and there was a lot of controversy surrounding this whole thing. They brought these wolves into the park and they put them in a, a pen here and let them kind of get acclimated to the area. They were afraid they'd take off and try to find their way back home to Canada if they just let them go. So they let them acclimate for a while before they finally released them into the wild. So why bring them back? Well, the official park line was that they were doing it for preservation. So over the time, the over time the park developed a policy of preservation which means that we're going to preserve this area as if humans had not disturbed it or at least to the the least amount of human disturbance as possible so because humans had eradicated the wolves we were going to reverse that decision or that um, process and bring them back to the park now there was really another reason going on that they really couldn't explain in the 90s to people. And that was this balance thing. What they felt was that the ecosystem was out of balance because the main predator in the park, the wolves, had been removed. But they really didn't want to explain that to people because 
people could argue, well, you know, um, we, we don't care about the balance, or what if it doesn't restore the balance, or who's to say it is out of balance? You know, there was some some real problems there that invited some arguments. So they really just leaned on their policy of preservation. We're doing this because we're trying to reverse human influences here. Uh, these are the predators that were eliminated from the park by people in the early days of the park. So wolves were eliminated, mountain lions also eliminated, also known as cougars. And then bears were reduced in number. They were never really eliminated, but they were reduced in number. Bears got down to about 100 bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem um, at one point. And so once they removed the predators, now now the early park superintendents, they thought this was a good thing. They were, they were actually trying to eliminate wolves and mountain lions because they thought they were detrimental to the other animals and dangerous to people. So they thought it was a good thing, but what it led to was an increase in elk they expanded to what the ecosystem would allow them to expand to. The problem with that was overgrazing. The elk expanded in numbers and overgrazed the area. What this led to, and here's a here's a chart uh, showing the elk numbers over time. Now there's a variety of things really that caused the ups and the downs, so it'd be too oversimplified to say it was just a matter of wolves, but they, they do really believe that that was a, a large part of it, but you can see their numbers really expanded and after the wolves introduced, their numbers have started to dip down. What it did was the overgrazing was it caused other animals to leave, including the beavers. So the elk ate most of the aspen trees, the beavers left, and when the beavers leave, it causes a lot of problems because what beavers do is they chop down wood, they build dams, and that creates livable water area and water brings life so beavers really are like the builders of the ecosystem and the, the number the beaver numbers were down significantly doug smith is the leading park biologist that i showed earlier in this slide and he oversaw the introduction of wolves or the reintroduction of wolves and has studied both beavers and wolves really his whole life he said, nature thrives on diversity and beavers are a huge generator of diversity. Now, Doug Smith, a lot of what I'm getting from this is from Doug. Let me go back to show you Doug here. Uh, Doug is just a really cool guy. They call him the wolf man because this has been his life, is studying and living with wolves. What I like about Doug, uh, although he's the park biologist and maybe some of the information you might think would be a little slanted towards, um, towards the park's viewpoint on this, I guess. And that's fair. But what I like about Doug is that he is a hunter himself. He's an avid outdoorsman. He really has a very balanced approach on this view of the wolves. Um, so when he was having to kind of sell this as a preservation thing, people, you know, he received a lot of pushback on this. P locals who live, you know, in the area, they don't, they don't want wolves. The, the wolves are kind of scary and they kill their livestock and they're worried that they're going to come after their kids and their family and all that. So, um, you know, he really had, he, he's really had a, a lot of pressure from both sides, both kind of the environmentalists and the, the people who wanted to restore him, and then also the local ranchers, farmers, and hunters. So I like his approach though. So I've used a lot of what he's taught in writings and in videos. Well, anyway, the predators returned. So they brought back the wolves, of course. The mountain lions actually started to come back on their own. And then the bears were also protected under the Endangered Species Act, and they grew in number. There are now about 100 bears in the park, about 150 bears in the park, but in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem are over 700. So they've significantly increased in number over the years. And so the question is, did this whole balance thing, did, did it work as they thought it would? Did it restore balance to the ecosystem? And the, the answer in a word is yes. They believe this was a huge part. They believe that the wolves were a huge part of restoring balance to the Yellowstone ecosystem. Take a look on this chart here. There's a lot of numbers going on here, but if you take a look at this gray, or sorry, this uh, tan line right here, You'll see that after the wolves are introduced, they spiked in numbers significantly up here to around 170. Now, the reason why they dip down here is due to disease. So wolves actually get quite a bit of disease and die off. 
but they ended up spiking early on and that's because there was so much elk there was such a huge food source that the wolves population took off then we have another disease episode here but then the numbers never do get back to where they where they were okay and they've leveled out for about the last 10 to 15 years around 80 to 100 wolves in the park and they believe that really kind of represents sort of a balance in the ecosystem now doug smith is really careful to use that word balance because ecosystems are always changing so there's no perfect equilibrium but he does believe that that really represents a, a, a steadiness it's kind of leveled out uh, to where where it should be and that overall the wolf experiment has been a wildly successful one and they about 10 years in to this process they saw the beaver numbers exploding now they weren't actually thinking about the beavers in terms of the ecosystem when they reintroduced the wolves but they noticed hey the beaver colonies are going like crazy well since the wolves came back the elk reduced plus they keep the elk on the run so the elk don't just sit in one place and graze the beavers came back they built more dams more water area brought more life there's more birds when the wolves kill an elk it really creates a whole process of life the wolves feed on it coyotes feed on it um, bears feed on it bugs feed on it birds so it really has been a dramatic success um, by all accounts that I've read well, let's talk just a little bit about wolf behavior uh, you can see here an image of a wolf compared to a coyote compared to a fox so just in case you had never seen them before wolves much bigger the coyote numbers were huge when the wolves were gone but they are not the same hunters as wolves and so they were still unable to keep the elk population in check since the wolf came back the coyote numbers have gone way down wolves actually kill off a lot of the coyotes when the coyotes come and try to scavenge their food let's just talk a little bit about wolves how they live and stuff they live they live in packs they live in families okay and they have a mom and a dad so the, they mate they're monogamous uh, so it's, it really is like a little family uh, they have alpha male or female there's they don't always know uh, which one is is which necessarily which one is the, the real leader and they have their pack they have a lot of pups but a lot of the pups die at a young age now, the average life expectancy of a wolf in the park is around seven years and outside of the park is around three years so wolves really do not live very long. They're usually dying because they get attacked by humans or they die while they're hunting or they get attacked by the wolves. Okay, as I mentioned, they have kids, little pups. They have quite a few pups a year, it seems like. And then they're territorial. Uh, they live in these, these packs that uh, the packs kind of own an area. That's why when you see them howling, what they're really doing is kind of saying, hey, this is our area, you know, get out of here. And this is in 2019, what the packs were. And what the general areas were now notice that uh that there's a lot of overlap right there's a lot of overlap in these territories and that's because they do cheat well first of all they don't draw boundaries of course so you know who's to say where the boundary is but there's a plenty plenty amount of cheating going on so if they can sneak into an enemy's or another pack's territory and and get some food they will but they always know that that's a dangerous thing they could get cornered by the other pack and and get torn up it leads to territorial battles. Sometimes there's some real nasty battles between packs as a result of that. My wife mentioned that the Molly's pack has been around for a long time and has always been ruled by females. And they tend to work together and they bring down bison. And uh, that's one of the biologists said that's one of her favorite packs because they they are so cooperative with each other. Uh, and then and then they hunt. So they hunt in packs. They they like to hunt their prey on the run so elk tend to run from them and they like to hunt them while they're running all hunts are dangerous for for wolves because they're hunting a, an animal that's much larger than they are so wolves are around between 80 and 150 pounds depending on whether they're male or female males being a little bit bigger and then they're hunting elk which are around 700 pounds 800 pounds something like that so anytime they're hunting that's actually a dangerous game for them they could get kicked in the face or uh, something like that they could die bison tend to turn and face the wolves so they don't really like to hunt bison both because they're bigger and because the bison tend to turn and face up face them but they will bring down some bison uh, if they're maybe young or or in bad shape same with moose only if they're younger in bad shape but moose uh, they don't really mess around with the adult moose um, 
they're too big. So I mentioned that they're packs, families, the kids move out. Uh, they have territorial battles, they hunt big games, so they're really a lot like human beings, okay? If you want to understand wolves, just think of them really a lot like human beings. They, do, they have, they have this, a lot of the same mannerisms that we do. Their only predators are really are us and other wolves. As I mentioned, if they're outside of the park, they're most likely going to be killed by a human being, either by being shot or by being hit by a car. Let me tell you about a very famous wolf. This is Wolf 06. It was a female, 832F. This is actually Spitfire's mom. And she was a legendary wolf. She could bring down elk on her own. She was really just beloved by people. These wolf watchers just absolutely loved Wolf 06. And she ventured outside of the park and she was shot by a hunter. It really generated a big outcry among wolf lovers, environmentalists, and all that, people who are anti-hunters, basically, to say, look, um, we need a, a buffer zone. So when the parks, when the wolves leave the park, you know, of course, there's no fences at Yellowstone, so once they cross the border, they're under the state laws, and a lot of the states allow hunting. Uh, so so there's a lot of groups that are, that are advocating for a buffer zone around Yellowstone so that these wolves don't get keep getting shot. The thing, though, is, you know, once the wolves came and the elk reduced, now the hunters in these areas don't have the same amount of opportunities to hunt elk that they used to. They really were opposed to the wolves, partly for that reason. And so allowing wolf hunting actually increases the tolerance that the locals have for wolves. Okay, if you can't, if you can't shoot elk, big bull elk with their racks and all that then getting a wolf is a a decent consolation prize for a lot of them and really what i'm trying to illustrate here is i'm neither a hunter nor am i an avid avid wolf watcher actually okay so i'm neither neither i'm not in on this i don't have a stake on this necessarily but what i'm really trying to illustrate here is that there's there's a divide there's there's a, a cooperation that needs to happen here and that's why I mentioned Doug Smith. He's a biologist, but he's a hunter and an outdoorsman. And he can, he's, I think, been really instrumental in walking that line with both sides. You know, he works in the park for the park. So he's, that's a little bit of a kind of public enemy for, for some of these Western states. Uh, if you're from the East, if you're not from around here, you need to realize that the federal government owns most of the land in the West. And... We don't particularly like it out here because for the very same reason that the American founding fathers rebelled is they saw England clear across the ocean running what was going on here in America and they had no idea what was going on here. They had no connection to the area. And the western states feel the same way. There's only 6% of the population that lives in the, in the Rocky Mountain time zone. So, and yet, all like 80% of our land is owned by the federal government. So what we have is Washington, D.C., way back east, doesn't understand us, and they're always telling us what we need to do with this land. And so there's some resentment there. There's a, there really is a divide that you have to be kind of a local to understand. Now, outsiders come in, environmentalists, government people, whatever, they come in and say, hey, you need to do things this way. And we're saying, hey, we don't, we don't want to. So that... There definitely needs to be a back and forth and an understanding on both sides of the issue. Uh, so I'm just trying to give you an introduction to that and let you know. Is, you know, when a wolf like this gets shot, the hunters become public enemy number one. But I don't believe that that's fair either. So maybe there should be a, a better, a bigger buffer around the park. Uh, I could see that, but you know, you're dealing with some complicated political issues. Okay, where to see wolves in Yellowstone? If you visit Yellowstone, they're mostly at the northern end of the park. So they call this the Northern Range. Uh, up at the top here, there's about half of them live in the Northern Range, and about half of them live over in Lamar Valley. Now, there's plenty of wolves that go outside of the park, as I mentioned. There, there's actually about 500 wolves in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, I believe. So th there's plenty that go outside, but but inside of the park is one of the best places to view them in the, in the world um, because Yellowstone's accessible and because there are about 80 to 100 wolves in the park.
Here's a picture on the right of people in Slough Creek out in Lamar Valley. I hope I'm saying that right. S-L-O-U-G-H. Slough Creek, I believe, is what it's called. And so, again, you'll have these avid wolf watchers. If you go there, you want to take your scope and binoculars. We've done another video about what to pack when you go to Yellowstone, and I'll put the links in here in the description for some recommended gear that you want to take with you. But you really do want to take something to view them. And people go out there and they'll just sit in their chairs and observe. You want to get there early in the morning or late in the evening. Dawn or dusk is when they're most active. Um, and again, here's you can see kind of the, although they extend down into Hayden Valley over here, you know, there, there's a lot of overlap right up here in the Northern Range and over here in Lamar Valley. That's really, these are, those are the two big areas to see them if you go to Yellowstone. Uh, you can also... <laughs> go to the Grizzly and Wolf Discovery Center, which is in West Yellowstone. They have grizzly bears and they have wolves there. I know they're not in the wild. I know it's not quite the same, but it is pretty cool. It's a good way to see them if you're not able to get all the way out to Lamar. They have a few uh, wolf packs here and exhibits and things like that. Really uh, a nice little area. When we went there, they have, have uh, here's a little pup and family kind of walking around here. So. We are releasing an audio guide and an itinerary for Yellowstone very soon. I'm very excited about it. Uh, this little video here represents some of my research that I've been doing for this audio guide. I have a lot more stories to tell. If you liked this video, please click the like button if you got any value out of it at all. Please click the subscribe if you want more tips.